Woe to the teachers of the law, the day of the saints is here. Woe to the Welcome to God News Network where the saints are rising, where we are here to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Are you a saint? How do you find out? By listening to God News Network and, of course, the Holy Spirit, which is God in the flesh. Thanks for tuning in. My name is St. Rick. I'm coming to you here beautiful on this Sunday, December 11th, as we approach the holiday of Christmas known from the pagans. We are here to se celebrate Jesus every day, not just on that one day a year where so many come out to celebrate. We believe that every day is more Christ. <laughs> With me, I have my good friend, St. Albert from South Carolina, who's probably enjoying warmer weather than we are here in Illinois. How about you, brother? How's he, how are you doing down there? Uh, it's good. Uh, it was a little cold yesterday. We we got down in the 20s, but uh, today it wasn't too bad. Uh, we were in the 30s, and uh, it's a beautiful day out there. Nice. Well, it, <clears throat> hopefully it gets up back up in the 70s real soon. I like the warm weather, not the cold. <laughs> as we get started today, we're going to be discussing baptism. Uh, as you will see by the title of the show, it's called Truth, the Truth on Baptism. And um, what is baptism? What is it, you know, who is it for? Um, what does it mean? Uh, is it necessary for my salvation? Uh, if I don't do it, am I still saved? Um, how do I do all those things? How, what does it mean to be baptized? And is there more than one type of baptism? What are the types of baptism that exist, if there are? Those are the things we're going to be discussing today. And um, uh, it's going to be quite a controversial subject if you are a legalist. We like to call them legalists, which are people who believe in self-effort self-works, works of the flesh, things that are required by you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Albert, <clears throat> we're going to start off with that. And what is baptism? Let's just dive in there and share with our uh, radio audience, uh, video audience, who, what is baptism? Uh, you mean the true baptism, uh, uh, Rick, or, or, or what we have uh, come up with in mm -hmm. church as a Let's start with <clears throat> what the true baptism is. Okay. Well, the true baptism uh, is uh, when you are baptized, when you accept Christ, and you're baptized by the blood of Christ. In other words, God's sacrifice and God's, uh, 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 what he did in the cross of taking uh, 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 giving you his life and all that and, and his life of course as we all know is the Holy Spirit the spirit of life you see when that spirit comes into you you have been baptized or you have been covered by by Christ and that's what baptism uh, uh, it is it's supposed to be uh, and um, you know, we celebrate that uh, that that as a uh, ritual, so uh, so people will understand. You know, the earth is full of uh, of uh, of stuff that God has uh, given us to uh, shadow, foreshadow uh, what we what what, uh, what heavenly things uh, are occurring or spiritual things are occurring because we cannot see spiritual things. Uh, I mean. Some people uh, sometimes see the the uh, outcome of spiritual things, <clears throat> but uh, we do not have the power to see yet. You know exactly how things happen. You know, uh, and and how God makes it happen. But but we could see the outcome of, of the things that happen. So uh, baptism, uh, the water baptism. That's that's what it is. You know, it's a it's a kind of of a shadow. So uh, we could get a hold or hands a hold of something that we do not understand or, or, or we don't know how it came about. You know, it's just like Jesus Christ talking to Nicodemus. 
and basically telling Nicodemus, hey, you know, and this, I'm paraphrasing, but listen, the spirit goes from one side to the other side, and nobody knows where it comes from, and nobody knows where it's going to. But it's there, and it's doing things, you see? And uh, for us, it's the same way. Spiritual things uh, that God has occurred, we know that they have occurred. We have, we have the outcome in us. We feel it. We know how the you know we know the spirit working in us, but we don't know exactly how it does it or where it comes from or how 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 it goes. Uh, we don't we don't we don't have that. So there has to be shadows like baptism, like water baptism. Hmm. Well, doing a search of baptism in the new uh, or in the uh, King James version, the word baptism occurs twenty two times, and it starts in Matthew three. Uh, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Then he says in Matthew 20, um, Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So let's take this right here. And let's go with the regular church, what the, a lot of the churches teach, a lot of the legalists teach. If they say baptism is truly only by water, then my question is, is why is this verse, um, if it's speaking of water, let's just say it is, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Was he referring to the water baptism? If so, then everybody could say, what? Yes, I can do that, right? But that's mm -hmm. not what he's discussing. This is not in context whatsoever. So if we look at the words here and look at the word baptized and baptism, um, it's uh, Strong's G907, which is baptizo, and to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, Vessels sunk to cleanse by dipping or submerging to wash to make clean with water to wash one's self. Hmm. I think that is what he did because he had to clean, someone had to be in the flesh to conquer the, the breakdown from Adam. So it took flesh to break it down, and it'll take flesh to build it up and, and to conquer. And man could not wash oneself. Who could wash oneself? Only God. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you're right. And, uh, you know, uh, the Bible talks about us being uh, baptized into his death which is what is what it talks about here this is exactly what it's talking talking about and uh what he's talking what, what uh what the disciples and all that what they were asking them you know that they could take his uh cup and all that that they could you know they could do what jesus christ did they're basically uh, not understanding that this baptism that god is talking about and and, and talking about for us that we were going to partake spiritually with him was a baptism of death, you know, because most people don't realize the meaning of baptism. They don't realize the meaning of what the bap water baptism is, mm -hmm. uh, less the meaning of what God did in the cross, you know, and that's the biggest problem with Christianity. Well, we, they don't understand. And we also saw where it was baptismo on the first one, and this is baptisma. This one here is uh, in context, let's read this in context here. So he says, um, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism? You'll see baptized is 907, baptism is 908. That's baptisma. And what's different about this, of calamities and afflictions with which one is quite overwhelmed. So this one is a um, 
you know, of calamities and affliction. We all know Jesus went through the afflictions of John's baptism, the purification right by which men confessing their sins were bound to spiritual reformation, obtained the pardon of their past sins, and became qualified for the benefits of the Messiah's kingdom soon to be set up. So basically, when John was doing baptism, he was purifying right by men confessing their sins, were bound to spiritual reformation, obtained the pardon of their past sins, and became qualified for the benefits of the Messiah's kingdom soon to be set up. When John was doing this, Christ had not completed his work. So when Christ completed his work, this no longer became valid because now to receive the kingdom, you have to believe. Um, if we go to Romans, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Here we go. Romans chapter 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we, pre which we preach. That if, here's the word of faith. Here it is. That if thou shalt confess thy, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart um, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. For with thy heart the man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is the baptism in that. Yeah. Well, let's let's look at a little bit about uh, about this in John and baptism and the old people in the Old Testament and the uh, people in the New Testament. Uh, Here we you go. You know, uh, the Bible says that until John, John was really not an Old Testament character, even though he lived in the Old Testament, he was in the New Testament uh, Old Testament character. He was the first of the New Testament. He was declaring to the people where salvation came from. In other words, he was declaring to the people the, the gospel. The, the, the uh, people in the old covenant, the way that they got saved was by looking ahead at the cross. And most churches teach this, and it's true. true. They were looking all the way from Adam. Adam was taught that there was somebody coming in that was going to save the world. They were looking for a Messiah. Well, they didn't know how the salvation was going to be uh, come about and why it was going to come about. But this was taught all the way from uh, Adam. And in fact, the Gospels, the letters of the Gospels, talk very good about the people in the Old Covenant. And it talks about Enoch. Enoch is all the way back there with Adam. You know, Edom, <laughs> Enoch was back there and Edom... Uh, he was a, a teacher of righteousness. He was taught righteousness. And what is righteousness? Righteousness is, only comes through the gospel. So all those people were looking ahead for the coming of the Messiah that was going to save the world. I mean, uh, you talk about Jesus Christ uh, when he was telling them uh, about uh, that he was uh, that that uh, Abraham saw his coming. I mean, the, the, that was still the old covenant. Christ hadn't hadn't uh, uh, died on the cross, and yet he said that he saw his coming and he was glad. Why were all those people glad, even in the grave? Why were those people glad in seeing Jesus coming? Because they recognized what Jesus was going to come to do in the world, and that was to die or baptism, his baptism of death towards the law, uh, and, and, uh, and free everybody from the old husband. You know, uh, baptism is a symbol of death. It's a symbol of you dying to a husband through Christ. So all these people in the, new, in the old covenant were looking towards his baptism. Even, even John the Baptist, John the Baptist knew. John the Baptist knew that there was going to be somebody coming in 
And he knew that person later on who it was going to be. It was going to be Jesus Christ. He was glad when John the Baptist was in the womb of his mother. He was glad about Christ because everybody knew it. A lot of people knew what Christ was going to, what was his mission here. They just didn't know how his mission was going to come about or how he was going to take uh, the sense of the world, but everybody knew it. And when John the Baptist, when people got around John the Baptist, and he would point out of Jesus, and, and the, what would he say? There is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You see? So hmm. everything was pointed. Everything was pointed to Jesus and his, and his baptism. And what we have, the water baptism, is is the baptism the baptism of Christ? It's a shadow of the baptism of Christ, and uh, it's funny how most religions out there treat this baptism, and uh, and don't realize what they're actually doing and what they're actually saying. You know, uh, I was brought up Rick Catholic, and as a Catholic, I was taught you know about the Catholic way of viewing baptism. And uh, and believe it or not, the Catholics uh, don't view the baptism so much as a new covenant uh, uh, ritual. They is really if you see if you hear what they understand, it's really an old covenant issue. Because uh, what they're actually saying is that the baptism takes away the sin of Adam. Well, when I look this up on Catholic.com, you'll see right here, it says, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, the Lord himself affirms baptism is necessary for the salvation, John 3, 5. They say that baptism is necessary for salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for the sacrament. So they're saying right in their Catechism of the Catholic Church that it is necessary for the salvation. So, you're right, Albert. They're saying that the Catholics are saying that it is baptism is necessary for the salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed. Yeah. So, I, I looked this up, and as I was studying for this, and wow, they're saying that, you know, do I have to be baptized to be saved? They're saying yes. Also, I have a paper here that says... Um, from the uh, Lutherans. I think this is one of the dividing things that divided the Lutherans and the Catholics because it says right on theirs, um, it says, um, um, you see here, I'm sorry, this is the Methodist, United Methodist Church. Do I have to be baptized in order to be saved? No, comma, but... Baptism is a gift of God's grace to be received as a part of the journey of salvation. To refuse to accept baptism is to reject the one, to reject one of the means of grace that God offers us, to reject baptism. So they're a little closer. And the Lutherans are close too. They're basically the same thing. Uh, Correct. That's why you see a lot of all this uh, people coming back to the Catholic Church a lot of them, the Catholic Church has a thing now that says, come home to, <laughs> to your home, uh, you know, uh, the Catholic Church, come to your original roots and all that, because all these religions are very close together as to what they, the Reformation, even the Reformation then did not come to these people. They came just a little bit, but not enough to understand what, how bad it is what they're teaching, you know. And, uh, and, and, and the sad thing about this, Rick, is that it's so hard because they have some aspects of truth in what they're saying. But the aspect of truth of what they're saying is minimal compared to the aspects of falsehood of what they're saying. You see? Because, yes, the baptism, baptism does have to do something with your salvation. And it does have to do something with the original, so-called original sin that came through Adam, it does, but not the way they say it. That's why it's so hard for people to get out of religion. And I'll explain to you this, why, why is, is, is there's a portion of truth in there? Because the original sin 
is not an action or something like that. The original is a state of sin because of the law. And the law, according to the Bible, is like a husband that we have to die to that husband, mm, right? Yes. And, and, and that death to that husband is really the shadow of water baptism. But that wasn't what killed that husband or, or the law, which is what it is. What killed the law was Jesus Christ, his blood and his death is mm-hmm. what killed the law. You yeah. see? So, or true baptism comes back again, not to a water baptism, but to a blood blood baptism. And, and, and all this, if you, if you remember in the old covenant, uh, all those rituals of, uh, of sacrifices, they were pointing us exactly to this death of Christ. That's, that was the beauty. That was a, a purifying, you know. And in fact, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions on sin. And, and in other words, without the shedding of God, Christ's blood, sin cannot be taken away or it cannot be dealt with. And all, so, the, all the previous rituals of the bulls and the goats' blood being shed once a year by the high priest was just a shadow of Christ's blood coming. So it was kind of a hold-off thing until Christ's blood gets here, and he left all of their sins and his forbearance unpunished, knowing his son was coming to be the ultimate sacrifice. Let's go back to what you were talking about earlier with John. We're here in John chapter 1, verse 1, and kind of want to set this up before we answer the Catholic um, proclamation of you have to be baptized in water to be saved. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We all know that's Jesus. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without, without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. They did not know the maker of the world they were in. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them He gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh that dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory in the glory as of the one only begotten father full of grace. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou a prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I 
and the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. And they which were sent of the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou not be that Christ nor Elias, neither that prophet? So here we go. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom ye not know. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John sees Jesus coming into him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with the water The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Not with water, but with the Holy Ghost. And I saw on bare record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, and he finds his own brother Simon, saying unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So we understand that Jesus will come baptizing with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with the water. His baptism was of repentance, as we read earlier, um, where it said John's baptism was of repentance. This was in the Strong's. He was also a Christian baptism, but as John's pointed forward to Jesus, it became obsolete when he came because Christian baptism followed faith in the Lord Jesus. It was associated with his name, which was invoked by the person baptized. It signified the remission or washing away of sins. It wasn't the washing away of sins. It signifies the washing away of sins. The receiving of the Spirit. So these are significations, but this word should not be confused with bapto. Strong's 9-11. The clearest example that shows the meaning of, a, of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet, physician Nicander, who lived about 200 B.C. It is a recipe for making pickles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. In order to make a pickle, the vegetable should be first dipped, babto, into boiling water, and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. So a dipping is babto, Submersion is baptizo, both verbs concerning the immersion of vegetables in the solution, but the first is temporary. The second is the act of baptizing the vegetable, producing a permanent change. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, most people uh, don't know this, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that a lot of the, the water baptism wasn't really invented by uh, Christians. I mean, uh, the Jewish people had ceremonies of cleansing. That's what baptism is. It's a ceremony of cleansing. It's a, it's a shadow of God's cleansing of our sins, you know. 
And uh, the Jewish people, just like the blood ceremonies that they had, uh, that they were representative of what Christ was going to do on the, on the cross. And that's what John the Baptist was actually doing. It was a ceremony trying to teach people, or, or, or try for, uh, trying to explain to people and to have a grasp as to what Jesus Christ came to do, you know. And so with the Jews, you know, they had the washing of the, of the clean dishes, not the dirty dishes. Uh, it was the ceremony of cleansing. You know, as you remember when Jesus Christ went out in the field and they, and they told him how they had washed their hands. Well, they weren't talking, uh, they weren't really uh, asking them to wash their hands to eat like for germ, uh, you know, or, or clean hands. They were, it was really a ritual. Again, those rituals were shadows of what Christ was going to do. Uh, the priest, uh, the washing of their clothes. And I mean, if you go to the uh, Old Covenant in Leviticus, like uh, we were on, in uh, all their books, uh, there's, there's loads and loads and loads of rituals of, of cleansing, you know. And, uh, and even today, we go even through some of those rituals uh, in the churches, uh, not as, as the Catholic Church, you know, but even in our singing, you know, we uh, try to explain this ritual. You know, he, he, there's a, a hymn I remember that uh, it says that he washed us as, uh, as white as snow, you know. Uh, that's kind of like a ritual coming back again to the understanding, trying to understand what Christ did in the cross, you know, even though a lot of times we sing it, but we don't actually teach it or understand it. Uh, but all these things, and John the Baptist was, again, the first person who really pointed out really who Christ was and what he came to actually do, you know. Uh, the Jewish people at the time, they were really messed up. They were even more messed up than the, than the Christians today uh, because what uh, most of the Pharisees and Sadducees, what they were really teaching was self-cleansing, uh, in other words, self-righteousness, and, and that you could do it, you know, on your own. You could cleanse yourself, you know. Uh, uh, you could, by your efforts, you could stay away, sustain from, from dirty things or, or clean things. That's why, you know, when uh, people were sick, you know, uh, you couldn't get close to people, or even women when they had the ministerial uh, uh, period. Uh, uh, I mean, they had to been there had to be a ritual of cleansing, and you couldn't touch them if you were a man because if you touched them, you became unclean. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. Uh, all these rituals, all these ritual laws, and in, and in uh, church today we have the same thing. Uh, don't think that that's just stuck with the all rituals of the Jewish people. I mean, just just one point, and I'm just going to make one point in today's church so you will understand. When Christ said that you came to him, that you are clean, I mean, we just talked about that last week, that we were justified, we were, I mean, you, you name it, we were clean, we're uh, just about the whole list. You could go through the whole list, and that's what he has done to us. We're, we're it. That's it. There's nothing else for, for us to do except for our flesh at the end of times to be clean like who we are. But yet, we go to churches and, uh, and, uh, and uh, they tell us, listen, if you have any sin in your, in your, in your past, uh, please uh, stay away from, from the ritual of, of, uh, of the Lord's Supper because Main, that's basically what they're saying. You're unclean and you're unworthy. That's what they're saying. Hmm. When you abstain from the Lord's Supper because of sin that we have in our lives and that we haven't confessed our sins for forgiveness and all that, basically they're coming back again to the rituals of the Old Covenant and saying that you're not clean and you're unworthy of taking the Lord's Supper because you're unclean. So as we could see, all these rituals and all this religiousness from the Old Covenant has still maintained very well in the new church. And uh, that was just one point of a, I could tell you a dozen points <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that are occurring today very well in the new modern church. So, wow. um, yeah. Well, I want to share with you guys 
basically this section with the Catholic priest, and we're going to go back to John 3, where their Catholic said John 3, 5 proves that you got to be baptized by water. And I've heard that taught so often. We're going to read this for ourselves, and we're going to see what it says. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Let's go to the, um, something a little easier to read here. We'll go to the New King James here. Uh, if I can get out of the way there. There we go. Okay. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was kind of like the high priest or the high ruler, like the Catholic church type thing. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, except, of course, it was over the Jews. You know, he was the Jew. Don't, don't intermix what I just said about the Catholics. They were just kind of an example of this guy's a high priest. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he's saying you have to be born again. Now, Nicodemus is a man of the flesh, so he answers in a fleshly answer. Nicodemus said to him, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Asking a question of the flesh, right? Of course, Jesus doesn't even answer him. He just kind of goes into the truth, and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of water. Let's... Let's break this down. Okay, when you're born of the Spirit, we know that that's accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right? Everybody agrees on that. Mm -hmm. Born of water. How is one born of water? Well, actually, if you continue reading, he answers that question. But everybody stops at 3.5. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There's the spirit side, and born of the flesh is being born of water. Why? What happens when a mother is about ready to give birth? The water breaks. He's referring to flesh. Let's go to the tools here. We're going to go down to born, 1080. Of men who fathered children to be born, of women giving birth to children. Okay? When we look at that and we see that we are born of water, and we look at water here, it's figuratively and literally water. Well, when women are born, or when men, women have birth or give birth, you're born by the breaking of the water. And when you read this in context through Jesus, he says that which is born of flesh is flesh, referring to being born of water, and that which is being born of the Spirit is Spirit, referring to and the Spirit. So he answers that you must be born again. Because the first birth that you had was of water. So you have to come through into the world through water, through your mother's womb. And then you have to be born of the Spirit, which is accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then like you said earlier, Albert, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus is like, how can these things be? And Jesus mocks him a little bit here and says, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? <laughs> mm -hmm. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, 
Ah, earthly things. Also referring to that which is born of the flesh is flesh. How will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the um, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Not through him plus baptism. It's through him. He believes in him is not condemned. It didn't say he who believes in him plus is water baptized. It says he who believes in him. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only begotten the son. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So there it is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank God that uh, he said there that, you know, he, when he was talking about, about the baptism, that it's spiritual. Because uh, if he would have been talking to Nicodemus about uh, physical water, about being born in physical water, all, all Nicodemus, he would have said, well, uh, Jesus, uh, since you are talking about uh, uh, physical water, you know, yeah. I know that the river flows, and I know where that water is going to. It's going to the ocean because, I mean, this is something that we know. And I know where it's coming from, too. It's coming from the rain that did our lake two miles away from here, you see. But yet he didn't talk about physical water. He was talking about spiritual, a spiritual birth, a spiritual baptism. And um, as we were talking about before, uh, about uh, how some religions— have a speck of truth in it, but then the other things are are just plain lies. Uh, you know, I was born Catholic, and I know very well the Catholic Church, and I know very well the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And uh, and uh, yes, baptism has to do with the original sin. And why does it have to do with the original sin? Because the original sin came from the law that that uh, uh, came through Adam, and that law was a husband. And so what Christ did on the cross with his blood was he eliminated, he died as a man to the first husband, so we as humanity could be free from the first husband, which was the, the law. Now, the law, what is sin? Sin is the breakage of the law. So if Christ eliminates the law, Guess what he also eliminates? He eliminates sin, and the problem is solved. You see? Oh, yeah. So so it does have to do with the original sin, but, and I know that they don't, the Catholic Church does not put baptism as uh, as in the uh, new covenant, what they think of, that uh, it eliminates every little thing that we do because. Those little little things that we do or sins that we do, according to them, is a combination of Christ and the Catholic priest to eliminate. They leave it up to them to eliminate all those uh, sins. So there you go. You know, it's a uh, it's an elimination, a combination of three things to eliminate different types of sins. While in Christ, all of them are eliminated at the cross. Hmm. That's right, brother. With that, we are coming to another close today on God News Network. And I want to thank you, Brother Albert, for being here and being faithful and listening to the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And for those of you out there listening, I want to thank you for continuing to be here each and every week and spreading the word of the gospel. For you know here at God News Network, you will hear the true news of God. That is correct. You will hear God's news. You will not hear the world news. If we do bring it in, it's always underlying in how God deals with it, not with 
hey, we want to tell you about these world news events that are going on. We want to tell you about the true news of God, which is the news that really matters and answer the difficult questions that maybe your churches aren't answering or people around you are not answering. We want to show you in the Word of God where the answers are. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to ask that you do that right now by saying, I receive him. I believe that he died on the cross for me and that he rose on the third day to salvation. And therefore, I am now free in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you said that prayer, you are set free. We don't want to forget to commune with God. We ask that you take your bread now. If you don't have any, next time you can join us and have it. And for now, just pray with us and know that you are partaking anyway. This is symbolism to know that this bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. And as his was broken, yours was healed, completely healed in every way, shape, or form. And you take this and eat it. And what you do is you know that by eating this, you are healed through his broken body. You may eat. And then this was for the remission of sins. And you have been set free from your sins. You have been set free from the bondage that holds you, makes you feel depressed, makes you feel like you're not worthy, like you're not good enough because you didn't do X or Y or Z or because you did X or Y or Z. This is what cleanses you, not you, not me, not church, not any of those things because his blood is what cleanses you. You do this in remembrance of him for the remission of sins. You may drink. Mm. Hallelujah. Hmm. Well, Albert, thank you once again. And to you, audience, thank you. Like always, spread the word. Tell them to get the God News Network app and join us for the greatest mission there is on earth. And remember, the saints are rising.